All right, moving on to the next little part here. Uh, still section two, okay, still section two of uh, Industrial Rev part one. Now let's start talking about England's advantages. Why did the European Industrial Revolution begin in England? There were a number of reasons. First of all, those factors of production. England had all of them. They had lots of land. They had, because of the rev agricultural revolution, they had lots of workers. And they had lots of people with money to invest. So those factors of production all there, industrialization can happen. Okay, industrialization, that building of factories, making goods with the machines inside the factories, selling those goods, that's all industrialization. That could happen because all three factors of production were there. England had a huge abundance of natural resources. Lots of timber, meaning wood, trees, lots of land, great waterways, lots of rivers. Rivers were very important for water power. We'll talk about that in a second. But they also provided means of transportation. You could float on a river to get from point A to point B. And then there was also a lot of coal that could be dug out of the ground. You burn coal, you can create power. All right, let's uh, take a little bit closer look at some more specific advantages that England had. So the aforementioned coal, you burn it, and you can help to you can uh, help to shape and create metals. You get the fire hot enough, you can melt metal, shape it, and create it into whatever you need. How do you think our tools are still made today? The metal has to be heated and shaped. One thing about coal also, and this is especially true once we start getting into steam engines, is that coal was a big part of helping to create power to help run the machines in the factories that made all the goods. Iron ore. England had lots of iron ore. Iron is just a very simple metal that's dug out of the ground, but once you process it, you can turn it into pretty much anything that you need that needs to be made out of metal. And eventually, once the uh, art of making steel was developed, iron ore is one of the critical components for making steel. And then England had lots of harbors. It's an island, so there's water everywhere. And with being an island, you're going to have a lot of what are called natural ports. We call them harbors. Places where ships can come in, they can float right up to the edge of the island, put, put in their anchor, and unload their goods and then load up on more goods and then go and sell them and come back and get more goods all right england had lots of harbors where lots of business and trade occurred more of england's advantages economics there were a number of wealthy people who, in England who wanted to start businesses. All right, They would take some of their own money, and sometimes in, these investors would uh, band together. They would pool all their money together and then create usually larger businesses. Sometimes it would just be single investors. They would take some of their own money, they would start a business, and if that business was successful, then that investor got a return on their investment. If the business wasn't successful, they uh, cut their losses and tried it again. All right, so investors were hugely important because they provided the capital, one of the factors of production, money to get businesses started and to keep them going. Also, England had a successful banking system. Because they were, for the most part, economically prosperous, Banks had money to lend to people to start businesses. So investors, sometimes they could also borrow money. And if they could borrow money, then they could also start businesses. And then the businesses were successful. They would get money back from the businesses. The investors would pay the bank off. They would have some left over for themselves. And they could live a good life. 
So because of the relative economic prosperity of, of, of England, investors and banks really started to get things going because businesses were started, they kept going, the money just kept on flowing. All right, we already knew that England had a large and great navy. Well, that hasn't changed. Okay, during the Industrial Revolution, England uses their great navy to a great advantage. These warships of England's navy protected the trade routes so that other countries couldn't come in and try to steal their ships and steal the cargo. So the large navy protected the sea routes, and England, man, they were just raking it in, raking in the dough. Also, political stability. England wasn't going through any revolutions. All right, They were, for the most part, pretty politically stable. Yeah, you would have a king die or a queen die, and then their heir would take over, but there weren't any big, huge, bloody revolutions. So because there was political stability, Parliament felt comfortable enough in passing laws that favored businesses and economic expansion. So it made lending a little bit easier by the banks so that money could go out to investors. <coughs> uh, laws were passed so that businesses could produce as much as they could so that as much as, as, much as could be sold. All right, so it, even the politics, even the government got involved in making sure that business kept booming. Okay, an image of, uh, I believe this is actually Manchester, not London. Could be wrong, but I think this is Manchester, England. Manchester is another uh, great English city that started to thrive under the Industrial Revolution. Here we see a very crude and very um, early form of a train, a railroad, a locomotive, as they were called. Okay, this is another video within the video. Uh, at the end of it, I'll go over the items that I want you to go back and get the information on. To picture England before the Industrial Revolution, you must imagine a nation that was the most powerful on Earth and yet possessed no real factories. A country that had just one large city, London. For the most part, England was a quiet and lovely land of farms. And rural villages, where only the sounds of weather, of animals, and the distant ringing of church bells broke the stillness of the landscape. Yet England was a land of great social inequality. A handful of aristocrats owned most of the land, and possessed by right of birth nearly all of the incredible wealth it yielded. They built magnificent palaces for themselves, and filled them with treasure while an enormous lower class, most of whom owned no land, struggled to survive, often paying rent to the wealthy landowners. These poor people sometimes faced severe malnutrition and even starvation. They usually died young. With this as a background, let us find out what great changes were to occur as a result of industrialization. The first industrial revolution began in England for several reasons. First, she possessed rich deposits of iron and coal, resources essential to industrialization. Second, England had many reliable sources of water power. And third, numerous colonies around the world supplied her with abundant raw materials, like this cotton. And at the same time, they provided an enormous captive market for her manufactured goods, like this cloth. These colonial markets helped to stimulate the British textile and iron industries. And in the beginning, it was the wealth produced by these two industries that drove the Industrial Revolution. During the mid-18th century, the growing demand for goods such as the iron hand tool seen here resulted in greater competition among manufacturers. And as costs of production rose, manufacturers sought new ways of meeting the increased demand for their products without raising prices. All right, so uh, with this video, a few things that I want you to go back and make sure you have down. 
is that what were some of the essential items from the land that uh, England had that were essential for industrialization? Okay, that can even be one of the questions you use in your left-hand margin if you want. Okay, what was uh, what was in the land in England that was essential for industrialization? Okay, what was it about England's rivers that was also so important? Okay, what was so what was important? What was uh, what was great about England's rivers that made them so important? And then lastly, and this is just something you take down in the body of your notes, you don't need to make it into a question, but England also had large markets where the goods that were manufactured in their factories, those goods could be sold, that money would go back to the business, the business would reinvest that money into more factories or more machines, they could create more goods. All right, so everything kind of revolved and it was a cyclical effect. You create goods. You sell them, you get money from that, you buy more machines or build more factories, put more machines in those, produce more goods, sell more goods, make more money, okay? Everything feeds off of each other. Now let's take a look at really the very first industry or um, kind of business that was industrialized. And that was the textile industry. Sewing clothes, making clothes. That's what textile industry means. It's the business of making clothes. Now the reason why the textile industry was one of the first, uh, first industries to be industrialized is because it saw the very, some of the very first machines. Okay, machines like the flying shuttle, the spinning jenny, and the water frame. Okay, they vastly improved how quickly cloth could be, or uh, threads could be woven into cloth. Because of these machines, you could get higher quality clothing, which meant you could charge more for them. And so simple and complex machines like these helped to turn the textile industry into, or from, everything being made by hand, to now most clothes being made by machine, which meant faster output, and you could get these clothes out to markets faster for uh, customers. Okay, here's a, an example of a, of a piece of flying shuttle. You have the thread in here, and it would move back and forth along a frame, and it would weave clothes. Here we have a spinning jenny, another uh, machine that would, uh, this one was hand cranked, so it wasn't powered by water, it was hand cranked. And it would uh, create clothing using a uh, loom. These are called looms. And the uh, thread would be uh, stretched along the loom, and then you have other thread that cr uh, crisscrosses over it. You have crisscrossing of thread over and over and over again. You get clothes. Basically, it just made the whole process faster. Okay, water wheels were important. Now, the way a water wheel works is that you have a big, huge, giant wheel made out of wo uh, wood, and a portion of it is stuck in a river. The flow of the river would turn the wheel because inside the wheel there were little, uh, little cubby holes, and the water would go into these cubby holes and the flow of the water would then turn the wheel. And the wheel would keep turning and turning and turning. Well, the wheel was hooked up to factories and the huge axle that the wheel was attached to would be connected to machines inside the factory. And so one big water wheel would help to turn all of the components of the machines and therefore you basically had a very cheap and a very abundant, abundant source of power to keep those machines going. So it's no wonder that a lot of factories were placed next to rivers. Okay, emphasize that point, definitely something on the test. <clears throat> Why were so many factories placed ne uh, on or next to rivers? Because of water wheels, water power. 
Okay, here's just some examples of some water wheels, and really giant water wheels, and a little bit smaller water wheels. Like I said, factories placed on or next to rivers. Now these uh, <clears throat> these large rods here, okay, these would be connected to sometimes water wheels. And so the water wheels would then turn these, uh, these long rods and it would then in turn power all of these machines. And so you have one large source of power now powering all, the, all of these machines. And it really helped with efficiency and it really helped to crank out a lot of clothing very quickly so they could get that clothing out to market. Very, very important. All right, some other inventions from the textile industry. Uh, we had the spinning mule, the power loom, and the cotton gin. Now the spinning mule was important because it created stronger, finer, and more consistent threads. Better quality thread meant better quality clothes. Better quality thread also meant that it lasted longer and so you could make more durable clothes, which then you could charge more for. Uh, the power loom was just another uh, machine that sped up the weaving process. And then the cotton gin, removing seeds from raw cotton that's picked out, uh, picked, on, uh, picked out of the ground, it's a very long and intensive and tedious process. Well, the cotton gin helped to speed this process up. By using these teeth that were on a spinning crank, it would pick out the uh, seeds from the cotton so that all you were left with was the raw cotton. Then this cotton could then be uh, processed and turned into, the, into thread. The thread is then weaved into clothes. So the clo uh, cloth may, or cotton uh, clothing process was greatly sped up. Unfortunately, in the United States, this had the unintended uh, consequence of increasing slavery. Because with more cotton able to be produced, um, more cotton needed to be picked out of the ground. Which for southern plantation owners meant... Let's get more slaves. So definitely an unfortunate, un, uh, unfortunate, unintended consequence of what was really a pretty cool machine for its time. And we're going to go ahead and take another break. And um, uh, when you come back and start the video uh, lecture again, it'll be the third and final section.